the starting point is that the capitalist ruling elite, which is headquartered principally in the US and to a lesser, maybe more subordinate extent in Europe, maintains its power by that legalized theft from some of the world's most vulnerable people. And military formations like NATO protect their capacity to do so and have always done so. Now, where does that leave us? It means that our struggle is tied to the cobalt miners of Congo. You know, it's tied to the dispossessed peoples of the Western Sahara, where NATO and the European Union fund a vicious Moroccan occupation used to steal primarily phosphates and fish from the territory. And the, the very basic point, which should be established in Europe, but isn't, is that you can't feed NATO with one hand and build an anti-capitalist politics with the other because the two are part and parcel of the same thing. But we also cannot pretend to fight capitalism while opposing very serious attempts to build beyond it in places like Cuba, Venezuela, China, and elsewhere, because those places are the pathfinders out of this hell that European civilization had created. However imperfect those paths are, they are the only paths. Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. We're at a major turning point in history. The US-led capitalist order is weakening amidst the rise of China and a more assertive Russia, giving the nations of the third world a bit more space to act independently of US empire. This poses a serious threat to the collective imperialism of the West that gained its wealth through centuries of dominance and plunder, and which has proven itself incapable of taking on the greatest challenges of our time, from rising food insecurity to environmental collapse. But Western capitalism will not go down without a fight, and NATO is the tip of its Cold War spear. To understand how this new Cold War might play out, we have to understand the foundations of the original Cold War of the 20th century. What was NATO's role? What did it mean for the Third World back then? What does it mean for the Third World today, particularly those countries who seek an independent sovereign path? What's the danger of rising fascist movements? And what are the lessons for anti-imperialists who live and organize in the imperial core? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Pavel Vargan, an organizer and researcher based in Berlin, the coordinator of the Secretariat of the Progressive International, and author of the recent monthly review article, NATO and the Long War on the Third World, in which he looks to the past for lessons about the future, concluding that capitalism cannot be overcome until the arteries of imperial plunder are severed. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. Pavel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Really happy to be here. I'm really excited to talk about your piece in Monthly Review, which I will, of course, link to in the description. Uh, but let's jump right into it. You write in your piece, and I'm quoting you. From the first time in capitalism's history, the global economic center of gravity is shifting decisively eastward. The balance of trade now favors China, and the nations of the third world are preparing for the end of the era of U.S. hegemony, a period of enforced imbalances in the world capitalist system that accelerated the underdevelopment of post-colonial societies. The tectonic movements unleashed by this process are sending tremors around the globe. And of course, here you're talking about the new Cold War. And I think, you know, to understand the new Cold War, it's essential that we also understand the original one that it's based on. And you frame that Cold War of the 20th century as this long colonial counter-revolution that played out along two geographic axes, the first being this all-out assault on the Soviet Union, and the second being uh, the liberation movements across the global south. So let's start there. Let's start with that first assault on um, on the USSR. And of course, to understand that, I think it's important to ask, you know, why was it that the Russian Revolution and the existence of the Soviet Union was so crucial to the struggle against colonialism? It's a great question. Again, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Um, I would maybe start by reframing the question slightly and thinking instead about internationalism and what internationalism means as a kind of political project. My sense is that 
uh, one of the cardinal principles of internationalism is that liberation begets liberation. A liberated peoples can help liberate another uh, peoples. And maybe it might be more useful for us to take a step back and start not with the Soviet Union, but with Haiti, hmm. which had the first major successful anti-colonial revolt, revolution that birthed a black republic. An idea that was so inconceivable even to the most progressive forces in Europe at the time that uh, no one thought it possible. And of course, all the colonizers immediately set out to destroy Haiti, right? The French imposed brutal debt under the barrel of a gun on the island. Thomas Jefferson said, I'm, I'm going to suffocate Haiti. He had a call with his French counterpart. He said, I'm going to suffocate Haiti, just like Eisenhower. And then every successive US president set out to suffocate Cuba. So that liberation, that project of liberation was intolerable to the colonizers. And it was intolerable because Haiti knew that if it bent to the will of these imperial powers, that would mean a return to slavery. It would mean a return to exploitation. And so it decided it would take a different path. It created a very small zone of liberation. And it understood that it had to work to expand that zone of liberation because it couldn't weather the, the storm alone. And so with its very limited resources against tremendous backlash from the imperialist powers, it sent material aid, it sent weapons, it sent troops to liberation struggles across Latin America. It sent weapons and a general, Benito Silvano, to Ethiopia to fight against the Italian colonizers. They won at the Battle of Adwa, and Ethiopia would not be colonized by the Italians at, the at that time. And then that same general went on uh, to uh, work as, a, as one of the organizers, one of the conveners of the first Pan-African con conference in, that took place in London in 1900. Um, interestingly, as an aside, I think W.E.B. Du Bois read out the declaration from that Congress, which issued a very prophetic warning uh, that said that the continued oppression and colonization of Africa would prove fatal to the high ideals of justice and equality that Europe purports to uphold. And this was just, you know, three, a few decades before the Nazis came to power in, uh, in Germany. Uh, so why was Haiti able to do this? because its people had acquired control over the resources of their state for the first time. And they understood that it was part of their mission to help use those resources in a way that expands that zone of liberation. And I think the same thing was true of the Soviet Union in a much bigger sense because the Soviet Union commanded many more resources. Now, I think there are maybe three things that I'd like to focus on in particular. One is something that uh, Vijay Prashad describes really beautifully in this book called A Red Star Over the Third World. And it was a very simple thing. It was the fact that so many anti-colonial leaders would, who would come to the Soviet Union would see peasants still with dirt under their fingernails, but with their chins raised high and their voices proud, who would be contributing to meetings, who would be discussing the future of their society. And this was, you know, who were literate. And this was not a thing to be taken for granted. So there was that kind of that, that source of, of inspiration. Another important factor, and I think we'll talk about this more later, is the, the conception that the Soviet Union developed through the project of communist internationalism of what capitalism actually was and where the source of its power uh, was. There was an Indian communist called M.N. Roy who attended the second Congress of the Communist International, and he presented this paper he called the supplementary theses on the national and colonial question. And he said that European capitalism draws its strength primarily from the legalized theft of the land and labor and resources of the rest of the world and uses that wealth not only for its own enrichment, but also in a sense to buy the loyalty of its working class. And so the idea emerged that until you sever those arteries of imperial extraction, capitalism will continue, will remain strong. And so the Soviet Union set itself the mission of supporting and working with anti-colonial struggles all around the world, whether or not they were socialists. Many of them weren't socialists at the time, but it was understood that that was the kind of core. Those threads had to be cut before capitalism could seriously be challenged. And the third thing is a point that my a very good comrade in Pakistan, uh, Amar Ali Jan, makes, which is that the October Revolution represented an epistemological break with the West. And by that, he means that the West was decentered as the site of global knowledge production. 
-hmm. Because all of a sudden, the most advanced ideas about how we build a future, how we build a world of dignity, emerge not from the West, whose ideals of the Enlightenment were betrayed by colonialism, but from Russia, from places like China, from places like Indonesia, which goes to the Bandung Conference, places like Cuba, which goes to the Tricontinental Conference. So I think those three factors injected a lot of confidence and a lot of potential into the broader anti-colonial movement. Yeah, that's really well stated. And, you know, in your piece, you also talk about how Nazism was, in fact, tolerated by the imperial rulers of the global north um, in the lead up to World War II until it was, of course, turned inwards, right? And you write, I quote, you know, it was it is impossible to extricate Hitler's mission from the long project of European colonialism or the particular expression it found in U.S. settler colonialism. And, you know, I think many of us on the left are, of course, aware of this. Of course, unfortunately, uh, in U.S. schools, I imagine it's similar in European schools, we're not taught about Nazism in this way. Uh, can you explain what that means and maybe even, you know, why that's so relevant to understanding the Cold War of the 20th century? Yeah, you know, I think few people in the colonized world would have been surprised by Nazism. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet Union wasn't surprised by Nazism. Now, I haven't done a deep dive into these documents, but the earliest mention of the menace, the threat of Nazism that I found in the documents of uh, the, the meetings of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was from 1924. In 1924, they were talking about, you know, the threat of white supremacy, settler colonialism, all of that, which, you know, Churchill was still praising fascism in 1937. No one in the West had a clue. Um, and I mentioned already that in 1900, you know, there was that prophetic warning given at the Pan-African Conference in London, where they said that colonialism would be fatal to Europe's ideals of justice and freedom and so on. If you read the giants of, uh, you know, the giant anti-colonial thinkers of the 20th century, like Amos Césaire, like Franz Fanon, they look back at the project of Nazism with a kind of fury and with a kind of, you know, I told you so. So Amos Césaire wrote this incredible book called Discourse on Colonialism, which I think everyone should read. And in it, he says, before Europe, Europeans were Nazism's victims. They were its accomplices. They tolerated it. They supported it as long as it was inflicted on other peoples. You know, this is the Nazism of settler colonialism. This was the Nazism of the concentration camp. This was the Nazism of racial pseudoscience, of eugenics, the Nazism of um, humiliation, all of which was tolerated abroad. Now, the US is a very interesting um, dimension here. You know, John Quincy Adams developed this idea of manifest destiny which is this notion that the white settlers from the east of the U.S. were destined to seek out more territory um, through land-based expansion to propagate the American way of life uh, to the savage lands. And they did this through the extermination of the vast majority of the native populations of that territory. And this idea of manifest destiny isn't so different to Hitler's idea of the Lebensraum, the living space, right? He looked at what the U.S. had done in terms of the Jim Crow laws that were enacted against uh, black people in the U.S., but especially in terms of the project of genocide and extermination against uh, the Native, uh, Native American peoples. And he said, uh, and this is, you know, I'm paraphrasing, this is almost a direct quote. Um, so he admired how the U.S. had gunned down the Redskins and their millions and confined the rest uh, to live in a cage or something like that. It was a direct influence. And I think it was a direct influence because unlike uh, Germany's own experience of colonialism, which although it wasn't as successful as that of some of its neighbors, it was vicious, it was brutal, it was a testing ground for a lot of these technologies. The difference with the US was that the US was a project of settler colonialism by land, of moving eastwards, of using this, uh, you know, again, pseudo racial science to justify the theft of land and the extermination of peoples. And Hitler said, I will colonize the wild east in the mm -hmm. same way that the u.s had taken over the wild west so you can trace that lineage you can trace that path from the colonial project in latin america and asia and africa through the project of u.s settler colonialism and into the project of nazi settler colonialism uh, which was aimed eastward <laughs> 
Yeah, and of course, we're never, it's never framed that way. That's interesting. You mentioned John Quincy Adams. I actually didn't, I, I, cause I always thought John Quincy Adams at some point came to oppose Manifest Destiny. He um, did, he did, he did. But I mean, the idea had taken root, right? At that point. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Um, but, you know, uh, there's that aspect of of Nazism, right? Where it, it it took so much of its influence from what was already happening in these settler colonial states like the United States. But then there's that element of the fact that capitalism uh, goes in many ways hand in hand with fascism, right? I mean, fascism in the lead up to World War II was seen and used by the US and many European rulers as this kind of bulwark against uh, communism. And of course, this is another very inconvenient truth that's omitted from many, most if, if not all US history textbooks. Um, and you write, precisely because fascism promised to preserve the structure of capital ownership, the West remained complacent and unprincipled in its opposition to it before, during, and after the war. So how was fascism back then seen as a useful tool for capitalism? And did that ever stop being the case? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Hitler promised openly that Germany would stand as a bulwark of the West against Bolshevism. So he saw if his historical mission, which uh, a lot of people in the West were sympathetic to for a very long time, as uh, preventing the spread of communism or preventing the spread of an emancipatory politics that would challenge the, the preeminence of private property in society. Now, I guess if we go back to the First World War, the biggest threat to the capitalist order the capitalist world order, really, which was centered in Europe, was the prospect of a communist revolution in Germany. You know, I'm calling in from Berlin now, which has a really beautiful and rich history of revolutionary organizing. And at the end of World War One, this city was largely governed by workers' councils that were organized together, you know, as part of a mass movement led in part by figures like Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. That movement had spread around the country. There were workers' councils in many different cities. Uh, and it presented a, a very severe threat to capitalism in Germany, but to capitalism in Europe more broadly. And that revolution would be brutally crushed with the complicity of the German Social Democratic Party, which, you know, once again is betraying the interests of the working classes, right. which at the time had ordered uh, a proto-fascist militia called the Freikorps to unleash really extreme violence on the revolution and destroy it. Hundreds were killed. You know, they were using weapons from World War One from the front. They shelled a working class neighborhood in Berlin. Um, they kidnapped, tortured and executed Luxembourg and Liebknecht. And that removed the primary opposition to capitalism, which at the time was in serious crisis following the First World War. And it didn't take very long for the fascist movement to consolidate its gains to fill that gap. And it eventually received tremendous support from German industrialists. You had companies like AEG, IG Farben, Osram, many others, some of which still exist today, who funneled hundreds of thousands of uh, Reichsmarks, I think they were called at the time, and other forms of support to build up the Nazi party, to build its legitimacy, to direct its policies, and then profited from the use of slave labor during the war. And, you know, yes. Many of the most of the wealthiest families in Germany today are inheritors of that money, um, which isn't widely talked about, which, you know, it's astonishing to me just a couple of weeks ago, Germany sentenced some pensioner, 90 plus year old pensioner to jail for her role as a guard in a Nazi concentration camp. Oh. But the people who profited from the slave labor in those camps continue to enjoy lives of luxury. Um, so, you know, fascism is useful to capitalists because it allows them to dispense with the illusion of democracy when that becomes too dangerous uh, for the preservation of their, you know, their economic interests. Now, a democratic society is dangerous for capitalism because it pushes societies to invest in things like education, mm -hmm. health, peace, dignity, things that might create additional demands for more you know, social advancement, for more equality and so on. Fascism allows the ruling class to dispense with all of that in the interest of crushing every, uh, every iota of opposition to the system and in the case of Nazism in the service of uh, an expansionist 
um, an expansionist policy. And, you know, there's that famous poem whose first line we often forget, which begins, first, they came for the communists. I hadn't seen this uh, quote by Henry or by Harry Truman before that you include in your piece. Um, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say that, or I'm just going to read it. If we see that Germany is winning, we ought to help Russia. And if Russia is winning, we ought to help Germany. And that way, let them kill as many as possible. I mean, this was a very common viewpoint among leaders across the Western world when Nazi Germany was like invading uh, countries <laughs> like Russia. And of course he said, he said that quote that I just read on the eve of Nazi Germany's invasion, invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. And then of course, this is the same person who chose to drop uh, nuclear bombs on Japan, which he called a hammer against the Soviet Union. And, you know, in the U.S., I'm sure you know this, the atomic bombing of Japan is, is taught to us as like this necessary evil that needed to happen to defeat fascist Japan. I mean, we know this narrative is false, but also there's the connection to the Cold War that's left out, which is the way that Truman's decision was, to drop those bombs was related to sending a message to the Soviet Union. Um also, by the way, like, I mean, this really begs the question about people like Harry Truman about whether they're psychopaths or not, because I know there was actually some opposition inside of the U.S., like sort of powerful circle that made the decision about dropping those bombs. But can you talk a bit about that um, piece of history that is often omitted, the fact that the atomic bombing of Japan was actually about the Cold War, or at least in part about the Cold War against the Soviet Union? Yeah, maybe let me start by saying that I don't think either Truman or Churchill were psychopaths. Or maybe wow. put, differently, <laughs> put differently, they were no no more psychopathic than the colonial and imperialist societies that created them, right? Mm -hmm. Winston Churchill was a vicious colonizer who went on a tour of India to shoot at people he considered barbaric, you know. He caused a famine in Bengal, which killed millions of people, and then he blamed it on uh, Indian people, he said, breeding like rabbits. Truman and Churchill were white supremacists, born from a very violent and very long legacy of colonial violence and impunity. Um, and there are many people like them, right? They weren't unique in their violence. They weren't unique in their disregard for other people's humanity. Um, as I write, uh, you know, and as I write in the piece, the the arrival of the nuclear bomb gave that white supremacy supreme power. For small-minded, for racist, you know, capitalist imperial overlords like Churchill and Truman, that power must have been intoxicating because they were used to having absolute power, right? And now they had even more of it. And we know that before Truman dropped the bombs, he approached Stalin, I think it was at Yalta, to tell him that he's about to use an astonishing new weapon uh, against Japan. Apparently, Stalin just shrugged because uh, he would have known that the weapon was in production, mm -hmm. even if maybe he didn't appreciate the magnitude of it. Um, now, we also know that at the time the bombs were dropped, the U.S. had already decimated dozens of cities in Japan, two degrees comparable to Nagasaki and Hiroshima after the nuclear bombings. And there's archival evidence of the various discussions that were taking place in the Japanese leadership that was um, uh, documented in this foreign policy article that I also cite in my piece, which showed that the political calculus in Japan only shifted towards capitulation when the Soviet Union declared war against Japan, which was three days after the bombing, um, the second nuclear bomb was dropped. Um, they knew what had happened and they had discussed what had happened. But the decision to uh, capitulate was only made on, I think it was the 9th of August, after um, the Soviet declaration of war. So, you know, the evidence points that the, the bombings were a kind of cynical ploy to show that the, the U.S. is the new power on the block and that it's unlike any power that the world has ever had ever seen before. And that remains true today. I think the same can be said of so many U.S. interventions, so many U.S. wars. Yeah. And just to have that like mad dog sort of uh, 
persona of like you can't you can't even predict how crazy we're willing to go we're willing to nuke an entire city and just wipe everybody out um now i want to move to that second axis that you mentioned you talked about the two geographic axes of the cold war so we talked about the first part being the assault on the soviet union um and then there's the second geographic axis of the cold war and that's of course the war on the global south and you write from korea to indonesia Afghanistan to Congo, Guatemala to Brazil, tens of millions of lives were claimed in a battle that would pit popular forces against a shape-shifting imperialism that tolerated no dissidents from its extractive drive, and that between these two axes of the Cold War, we find a historic battle between competing engines of emancipation and submission, and that that struggle never ended. So how did the collapse of the Soviet Union impact that second axis of the Cold War. Um, and you actually mentioned this, this was a striking uh, number that, that I saw. You mentioned that some 80% of US military interventions after 1946 took place after the fall of the USSR, which I, I hadn't known that. Uh, but sorry, to the original question, I mean, how did the collapse of the Soviet Union impact that second axis, that, that assault on the global South that you mentioned never actually ended? Yeah, the, the, the numbers are actually very interesting. I took that data from this document that was produced by the Congressional Research Service in the US, which just lists, it was a, like, it's like 30 pages or something or more. It lists all of the US military interventions line by line in kind of like an Excel table um, from 1798 to 2022. And if you just count them, you see a massive spike after 1991, 1992, which is also surprising to me. Now, the question, it's a good question. It's a very difficult question to answer. And I think there are two things that I would focus on. The first is that after the Second World War, the U.S. for the first time emerged as a global superpower, perhaps as the global superpower. Now, the U.S. had already you know, committed genocide in, uh, on its own continent. It had already taken over half of Mexico. It had already engaged in a bunch of other invasions. The Monroe Doctrine was already in existence, but really this was the moment when Europe was fatally weakened um, and in a sense brought into the U.S. sphere of influence through the Marshall Plan. The Soviet Union was absolutely destroyed, 27 million lives lost. China, similar, similar uh, number of casualties, was also um, destroyed and the U.S. kind of emerged unscathed. In fact, it emerged strengthened. And that newfound position very quickly found a reflection in the ambitions of U.S. foreign policy circles. There was this astonishing document that was published, I can't remember, either in 1949 or in 1951 by the State Department. I don't really, it doesn't really matter. The document outlined the overt goal of U.S. foreign policy in the post-war era. And it had this wonderful quote, which said, to seek anything less than preponderant power is to opt for defeat. In other words, this binary emerged. Either we dominate the entire planet, we have preponderant power, or we lose. And so this became the kind of driving mechanism of US foreign policy. And of course, the nuclear weapon, that show of power, that immense show of almost omnipotence, uh, at least in the sphere of destruction, uh, was the starting point um, of, that, of that agenda. Now, the US had nuclear primacy for a time, but we know that in uh, I think August 1949, the, the, the Soviet Union had tested its first successful uh, nuclear weapon. And that started to chisel away at U.S. primacy in this space. Now, a very important concept emerged, a very horrible concept, you know, born from the, the violence of the atomic bomb, but a very important concept called strategic parity, which means that where there are two sides to a conflict, two superpowers that are equally matched, that will protect against a violence between them because both sides know that an attack by any one power will lead to the destruction of both sides, right? This eventually was articulated as the theory of mutually assured destruction. Right. Now, we know from figures in the U.S. administration, like Robert McNamara, who's recounted in various interviews, that all the way in the 60s, there were still insane people very high up in the U.S. government who were saying, well, we've still got more nukes than them. Let's just wipe the Soviet Union out. Let's do it now. And it took cooler heads to prevail and reason to prevail for that not to happen, even though we came very close um, to that destruction, uh, to that you know, 
possibility of mutually assured destruction. Now, there came a point where that doctrine, that idea that you can't win a nuclear war started to erode. This began in the late 1970s under Jimmy Carter, when he basically forced NATO countries in Europe to uh, uh, accommodate U.S. nuclear weapons, uh, the U.S. nuclear arsenal, which actually ended up kickstarting the European anti-nuclear movement. Um, and the move was based on this theory that was developed further, uh, especially developed under Reagan's administration, called counterforce nuclear power, new doctrine that replaced the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Now, at the time, interestingly, there was broad scientific consensus um, about this uh, idea of a nuclear winter, which said that if there's a thermonuclear war, you know, after hundreds of millions of people or tens of millions of people die from the blasts, a layer of ash will blanket the atmosphere that will cause a degree of cooling so profound that the rest of humanity will die out within a year or two of starvation, cold, you know, uh, horrific, horrific things. People will wish that they had died in the fires. Right. It was absolute scientific consensus about nuclear winter theory. But the U.S. had developed a new uh, doctrine of nuclear supremacy. Counterforce power said that if the U.S. launched a sufficient first strike against the Soviet Union and was geographically proximate enough to it, it could disable the Soviet Union's capacities to respond. Right? Absolutely insane idea. And to uh, support that idea in taking root, they had to strike at the science of nuclear winter theory. So they launched a decades-long anti-scientific propaganda campaign to discredit nuclear winter theory. And you can still find, you know, YouTube influencers who post long videos about why nuclear winter theory is no longer applicable to <laughs> the types of warheads funded, of course, by the U.S. military industrial complex. It's insane. And very similar, in fact, to the propaganda that emerged about uh, climate change. But so nuclear weapons moved to Europe. This idea of uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear primacy emerged, and then the Soviet Union collapsed. And instead of withdrawing those weapons, the U.S. identified an opportunity because, remember, their goal was preponderant power. Their goal was to be the sole power. So all of a sudden, an opportunity emerged without the threat of a counterattack, because that was, for a time, uh, disabled, right. to uh, establish, finally, global dominance, including in, uh, you know, in the sphere of nuclear primacy. So now there are about 100 nuclear warheads in Belgium, in Germany, Italy, the Netherlands. I think there are 50 in Turkey. And remember, the U.S. placing nuclear weapons in Turkey was what sparked the Cuban Missile Crisis because the Soviets responded by putting nuclear weapons in Cuba. So it's a very dangerous situation we see today. And I think many of the crises that are happening, including the war in Ukraine, can be explained in a large part by the failure of that strategy of dominance, by the fact that it was too ambitious, too broad in scope, too unsustainable. 800 military bases around the world, an attempt to control the entire infrastructure of the global economy, um, which failed. Um, but now we have an increasingly insane and cavalier uh, you know, ruling class in the US, which is, uh, uh, which is starting to flex its military muscle again in ways that are unpredictable and dangerous. Yeah, and it is really frightening when you give that background and you think about the thought process of a lot of these people in positions of power when it comes to escalating in Ukraine and not taking seriously the idea that it could snowball into some sort of nuclear warfare or thinking that if it does, it's actually not a big deal because you have smaller nuclear weapons now. It won't do that much damage and it's just, it's completely insane. I want to get to the issue of NATO, um, but before we do, I think it's important to, to lay this out. Um, you know, you say in your piece that the struggle between imperialism and decolonization must be understood as the principal contradiction, the determinative battle for the future of humanity. And I think that's so important, especially, uh, especially for anybody who's in one of these sort of imperial core uh, states where, you know, we who are struggling for socialism in in their respective countries, because imperialism is the principal contradiction. So why can you explain why the struggle against colonialism and imperialism are so crucial to overthrowing capitalism? And then, of course, where does that leave the anti-imperialist left in the West? 
Yeah, so one, one goal that I had in writing this piece was to kind of shift the axis of thought that many uh, people, especially in Europe, many leftists in Europe have, where there's a kind of, uh, you know, almost like a pseudo-religious understanding of the world where there's the West, which is still basically good, and there's the East, which is basically bad, and then there's the South, which doesn't exist, yeah. unless, you know, except in certain specific contexts. And really, the, 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 the 20th century, at the heart of the 20th century, was a very simple story. And it was a story about peoples all around the world, especially in what we call the Global South now, or what became the Third World Project then. Um, story about those people rising up to work not for the enrichment of others, but for the development of their own society. And that project was most forcefully articulated in the Global South, in the Third World, and so on. Now, the capitalist powers wanted to stop that process of emancipation, wanted to stop these forces, because as we saw earlier, they drew all of their wealth from the exploitation of the colonized world, from the, of the colonized people, from the theft of their land, their resources, and their labor. Christopher Columbus knew this. You know, we talked about Haiti earlier. When Christopher Columbus first came to Haiti, he wrote to uh, uh, Ferdinand, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, and he said, whoever has gold, can do whatever in the world that he wishes. And this is what he did. You know, they, they massacred the native population, exterminated the native population of Haiti. They imported human beings um, as slave labor to replace those native populations. And uh, you know, that, that marriage of stolen wealth and impunity, I think sits at the heart of what we call white supremacy. Now, if we look at the big corporate head headquarters in London or Frankfurt or New York or wherever you might live, how many of them were financed by exploited, underpaid workers mining cobalt in Congo or the destruction of the Amazon or the exploitation of garment workers in Bangladesh who, who fuel fast fashion? You know, the French development agency calculated uh, a, a few years ago, uh, I can't remember exactly when, but calculated that for every euro that France gives to Africa in aid, it extracts three as interest rates, as uh, you know, resources, and so on and so forth. So the starting point is that the capitalist ruling elite, which is headquartered principally in the US and to a lesser, maybe more subordinate extent in Europe, maintains its power by that legalized theft from some mm -hmm. of the world's most vulnerable people. And military formations like NATO protect their capacity to do so, and have always done so. Now, where does that leave us? It means that our struggle is tied to the cobalt miners of Congo. You know, it's tied to the dispossessed peoples of the Western Sahara, where NATO and the European Union fund a vicious Moroccan occupation used to steal primarily phosphates and fish from the territory. And the, the very basic point, which should be established in Europe, but isn't, is that you can't feed NATO with one hand and build an anti-capitalist politics with the other because the two are part and parcel of the same thing. But we also cannot pretend to fight capitalism while opposing very serious attempts to build beyond it in places like Cuba, Venezuela, China, and elsewhere, because those places are the pathfinders out of this hell that European civilization had created. However imperfect those paths are, they are the only paths. Yeah. Um, I Let's so let's focus on NATO for a moment. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. You can't feed. I love, I love that you can't you can't like destroy capitalism while feeding NATO. It's exactly true. And in the West, NATO is of course framed as this force for upholding freedom and upholding democracy and the so-called rules-based international order against this authoritarian access led by you know, Russia and China and NATO is also increasingly being reconfigured into this anti-China alliance. Um, and sadly, you know, I think this is true more for Europe than the U.S. In the U.S., I think the the organized left is very much been consistently uh, opposed to NATO. And I think that's really good. It's probably because there's a lot of geographic distance between what's happening in Ukraine for the U.S. versus you know, the European left seems much more entangled in the idea that NATO is, in fact, a force for freedom following this war in Ukraine. But NATO's roots are anything but free and democratic. And, and you talk in your piece about how quickly the allied powers after World War II 
then led by the U.S., recruited fascists to do their dirty work against communism and liberation movements around the world. And while World War I was all about inter-imperialist rivalry, World War II birthed this U.S.-led West that engaged in what you call collective imperialism. And with this, you talk about NATO's fascist inheritance. And you write, if fascism is a tool for shielding capitalism from democracy, NATO is its incubator. I mean, you kind of already laid that out, but can you kind of, can you elaborate a bit on that as NATO being this incubator for shielding capitalism from democracy? Yeah, you know, if if you Google fascism and socialism, you'll find like a bazillion academic papers written from the ivory tower of Western academia, which would be like, well, fascism combines elements of socialism and capitalism, right? <sighs> Yeah. And there's this kind of assumption that fascism is almost to a degree separate to capitalism, that in fact it draws a lot more from the kind of authoritarian tendencies of socialism. It's not. It doesn't. You know, it's a desperate form of capitalism. It's a violent form of capitalism. It might arrive as Nazism did, wrapped in the red of revolution, but it's uh, it's the, you know its leaders arrive with pockets filled with corporate money. Yeah. And if you look at the formation of NATO, first of all, you know, NATO was explicitly designed as an anti-communist alliance, much like the fascist project emerged explicitly as an anti-communist project. And it began with the rehabilitation, as you said, of various unsavory forces in Europe, including figures like the fascist Antonio Salazar, the dictator of Portugal, who was one of the founding members of NATO. Right? And then Amilcar Cabral, who was leading revolutionary struggle in Guinea-Bissau and other places, wrote that they would find weapons of war from Portugal, from Germany, from Spain, from across the NATO bloc. bloc. So there was an implicit, already then, an implicit understanding that NATO is an extension of the colonial project and a kind of collectivization of the colonial project. Now, if you look at the situation today, you know, who are the main cheerleaders for NATO accession? Lily Lynch wrote this really interesting piece in New Left Review a while ago, sometime last year, which looked at the situation in, in Sweden and Finland. And she found that the most ardent cheerleaders for NATO were the big industrialists, the business leaders. Now, there's this guy, Jacob Wallenberg, whose family wealth accounts for something like a third of the Stockholm Stock Exchange, um, who has massive shares in the military industrial complex and who stands to win a lot from uh, from accession and from war. Um, and he was one of the most ardent supporters of accession. Although, you know, now it turns out that Sweden is too racist for NATO, <laughs> even for NATO. Um, so that's off the table. Um, but, you know, then you enter the alliance and what happens? Well, one is you strengthen precisely those elements in your society that were keenest to join, who are the war profiteers, the big industrialists, the warmongers, the second is that you're required to align your weapons to the NATO standard, which usually means buying tons of weapons from the U.S. military industrial complex. Again, strengthening that central note of imperialism. Third, it means you, you're required to spend a certain portion of your GDP on military expenditure, which kind of in itself erodes democracy, right? Because people don't care what weapons you buy. Right? People care if you build schools, if you build roads, if you build bridges. People don't care about weapons. So you remove 2% of your budget removed, 2% of your GDP, not your budget, removed from the democratic equation for spending on weapons of war. And then, of course, finally, you, you, you come to answer to a political and military strategy that's largely dictated from the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see in Germany, this was the, the pathetic way in which Olaf Scholz kind of pussyfooted around the question of tanks. He said, I'll do it when Biden does it. I'm waiting for Biden. And Biden <laughs> said, okay, we'll send some tanks. And Germany said, okay, we'll also send them. <laughs> And then Biden said, okay, but our tanks might not arrive in two years. You know, even though the German Green Party, the most warmongering wing of this coalition, had promised before the election that Germany would not send weapons to an active war zone. That was part of their electoral commitment. But Biden said that they have to send tanks, so they're sending tanks. So, you know, in NATO membership, you strengthen the most reactionary elements in your society, 
while ultimately funneling a part of your social surplus, uh, you know, your national budget that could be spent on schools or hospitals, or, you know, atoning for the crimes of colonialism towards militarism. Yeah. And, uh, I'm curious if you can talk a bit about that. That's just so funny. I mean, Germany is pathetic um, in how it's behaved in general, but it's really demonstrated over the last year that it it has a severe sovereignty problem um, that I don't think Germans realize they have. But I wanted to ask you, you know, what is the significance of this thing called the Wolfowitz Doctrine after the fall of the Soviet Union? And where did NATO fit into that? Yeah, so this is, um, you know, I talked earlier about this uh, idea of the U.S. seeking preponderant power. There's a very clear thread from that to what became known as the Wolf of its Doctrine. I'll talk about that in a bit. But let's look at the collapse of the Soviet Union and that, the kind of period, the few years before and after that. A few things happened. First, Mikhail Gorbachev proposed at some point at the end of the 1980s, a kind of common security architecture for Europe. He had this vision for a European common home, which was kind of naively grounded in this idea that you can build peace with the West. Um, but for a time, it seemed that those proposals might come true. So in 1991, you had this big thing called the Con Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, which became the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which met and adopted a document called the Charter of Paris for a New Europe. And the Charter of Paris said that a new era of peace had emerged and that Europe would now commit to building a common security architecture for the entire continent, including the territory of the former Soviet Union. And that that architecture would be grounded in the principles of cooperation and mutual respect set out in the UN Charter, the document with the greatest uh, consensus, uh, you know, global consensus in history. Now, that same year, that, or maybe a year later, 1992, after uh, about a year of work, this document called the Defense, Defense Planning Guidance leaked to the New York Times. Um, it had been drafted by Paul Wolfowitz and this group of uh, foreign policy intellectuals in the US you know, State Department, uh, Defense Department, and so on. And it set out the contours of US grand strategy for the post-Soviet period. And it said, we can never allow another state to rise to the stature of the former Soviet Union again. That is our explicit policy. So the goal of US foreign policy and defense policy after the Cold War was to prevent the development of other states. So I think NATO has to be seen in that context, right? While Europe was imagining what a future of peace in Eurasia might look like, uh, George H.W. Bush calls Helmut Kohl in Germany and he says, we won. They lost. We can't let the Soviets seize victory from the jaws of defeat. That's a direct quote. I think he also says to hell with them or something like that. <laughs> um, then he calls a month later, he calls French President Francois Mitterrand and he says, no organization will replace NATO in Europe. And this is after they had kind of tacitly given the green light to the uh, CSC process that created the Charter of Paris. And many years later, in 1997, speaking of Dzerzhinsky, who was one of the great architects of U.S. foreign policy in the 20th century, wrote a book called The Grand Chess Board, where he kind of explained some of these maneuvers. He said, the end of the Cold War saw the U.S. emerge for the first time as the paramount power. For the first time in history, there was a truly global power with reach into every corner of the world. And he said the U.S. had a very clear economic interest in gaining unlimited access to the hitherto closed area of the Eurasian landmass, which had been dominated by the former Soviet Union. And he said that Ukraine was an important piece on the Eurasian chessboard. Wow. It's almost like this is important to understand in order to understand what's happening today. <laughs> Did you, I sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Are you done with that? that yeah, no, okay. I'm done. I mean, yeah, it's absolutely You're like, critical. mic drop, mic drop. <laughs> like, it's absolutely critical to understand. Yeah, but yeah. It, it flies over so many people's heads, and it's not widely known. You know, there's still the myth of, US, the myth of Western benevolence. You have books 
you have documents, you have speeches given by the architects of these policies. Yeah. With flagrant disregard for human life, expressed flagrant disregard for human life, total impunity, and yet it's still difficult for many people to accept. Right. No, I mean, there's there's like so many there's collections of quotes and videos of even Joe Biden at some point stating the obvious about Russia's red lines when it comes to Ukraine and why. But it doesn't matter. Yeah, tanks uh, mean World War Three, I think he said. Right. Yeah. And then where are we now? Like, it's like no big deal. We're just sending loads of tanks to, to Ukraine. Well, in um, months or years, quote, unquote. Yeah. You know. yeah. Well, I, you know, you also write that the mission of NATO expansion is inseparable from the cancerous advance of the neoliberal model of globalization, which hardens within NATO member states into a condition of perpetual exploitation. There's just so many different angles on how uh, NATO becomes this, uh, you know, bulwark against democracy and, and neoliberalism is, is, is such an important one. And a perfect example of this is the economic plans of NATO countries for Ukraine, which are horrible. Um, just all of the sort of privatization and like theft of public resources that we've seen in one country after another. And we've already kind of seen that in Ukraine to a certain degree, the stripping of labor rights. Can you talk about that and why it's especially important for those on the left to understand that there can be no socialism within NATO because of what it enforces economically? Yeah, so so it's a very interesting, very important question. Before, because because NATO expansion is a process, and because the accompanying expansion of neoliberalism is also a process, I'd like to start not in not in Kiev but in Warsaw. In Warsaw in 1997, um, there was this conference of I think the Euro Atlantic Association, which was discussing Atlanticism, NATO, and Poland's accession, and so on. And a young senator not so young actually at the time, but a senator called Joe Biden <laughs> came to Warsaw to speak about the conditions that Poland would have to meet to join the alliance. Now, as you know, Poland, Poland's socialist project had collapsed uh, about you know, seven years earlier. That accompanied a massive process of shock therapy and privatizations that were incredibly painful for society but actually were not as painful as they were in other places because in parallel, we were funneled with German money because Germany wanted a stable neighbor on its border. So, you know, it wasn't as bad in Poland as it was elsewhere, but it was a vicious process of, of privatization that had no democratic mandate affected. So Biden starts by praising that process. He says, you know, every state is free to choose its own economic model. It just so happens that every NATO member has chosen the free, you know, the free market as the guiding principle of its economy. And then he says, you know, after praising this process of shock therapy, he says, don't stop there. To ensure that economic rather than political incentives govern, you know, Polish, uh, the Polish economy and Polish businesses and that people have uh, a say in how their economy is run. Poland will have to privatize the state airline, the state copper industry, the state telecommunications industry, the bank and so on and so forth. So already in the conditions of NATO membership, um, among the conditions of NATO membership was the sell off of the very basis of Polish economic sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Now we turn to Ukraine. What has been happening since 2014? Well, you had massive, massive labor, labor liberalization laws that were passed uh, before February last year. Um, but which intensified under the cover of war. Um, something like 80% of Ukrainian workers have been deprived of collective bargaining rights. Um, trade union property has been confiscated under the pretext of decommunization. There's proposals on the table now from the Rand Corporation, you know, one of the brains of US militarism, for the sell-off of several thousand state-owned corporations as part of the process of reconstruction. You know, it's really a free-for-all much in the way that the entire former Soviet Union was a free for all in the 90s. And so you see that along with admission to the so-called Western world, you acquire a certain peripheral status uh, within, within that system right. and you become subordinate to its economic roles and economic principles in a way that's ultimately detrimental to your society. I think, you know, Poland lost 2% of its population um, in, in that period after accession. 
There was a, a period of time in which 14% of the working population of Poland had gone abroad in search of work for some period of time. And that's not a sign of a healthy economy. And of course, now we're still pumped with European Union funds, which has kept us afloat. But as a process, project of long-term sovereignty, um, very difficult to think about that within the constra constraints imposed by NATO and the wider kind of Western neoliberal project. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned in your piece about Poland, I, I wasn't aware that Poland had played a role in designing Iraqi cities decades earlier. Um, and this is, I mean, this is really chilling. You say, we sent troops to lay siege, to speaking of Poland, we sent troops to lay siege to the cities we helped build. And you blame NATO for, NATO membership for that because of how much it changed Poland. And it's basically, I mean, NATO membership is essentially giving your foreign policy or handing it over to the United States. Um, and then you become an extension of that. But I wanted to talk to you about ideology in this, this new Cold War, because after the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, Russia became a capitalist country, right? And it tried so hard to be an ally of the West and even had up until very, well, it had a, a pretty, it had a desire at some point to even join NATO. And up until recently, I mean, it still really had this like dream to be a part of the Western world. But as you say, Western aggression pushed Russia to prioritize sovereign development. That historical process also pushed it into alignment with the broader third world project. This is so different, I think, from the first world war where there was this for the most part, I mean, not it's not this black and white, but there was somewhat of an alignment of economic ideology in the Cold War of the 20th century on some level. Whereas in this new Cold War, the targets of imperialism are uniting, not necessarily out of like a shared economic ideology, though I've heard some make an argument that centralized state-led economic independence is a kind of ideology, which a lot of these, these states share. But it's more out of this sort of collective grievance. And that's what... Brzezinski famously warned about, right? And um, I don't have the quote in front of me, but it's from his one of his books, warning about how there would be, or, or warning of the dangers of, of of states that are targets of basically the West of joining together in a kind of collective grievance. And that's that's how you have Russia, China, Venezuela, Iran, Syria, Cuba. These are all very vastly different countries with very different systems. Um, forming alliances. So do you think that this dynamic that we see now, where it's not based on necessarily an economic ideology, but it's based on just kind of like standing up for, I guess, your ability to, to have some sovereignty and independence, does this pose a bigger challenge for the West than perhaps the first Cold, World, Cold War did? Yeah, I think there are two parts to your question. I'd like to answer both of them. One Please. is about... <laughs> One is about identity mm. um, and ideology, and the other is about the challenge to the West. You know, I, I'm in Berlin right now, and when the German Democratic Republic existed, Eastern Europe started basically in Berlin. Right? Eastern and Western Europe, they're not geographic concepts, they're very fluid political concepts. Um, after the collapse of the socialist project, Poland rebranded itself as Central Europe and joined the so-called West. And now Ukraine is presented as more Western than Germany, um, you know. So in other words, if you're Eastern European, whether that's Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, whatever, under certain conditions, you can be granted access to the club of whiteness, club of whiteness, club of the West, on the condition that you go and bomb some brown people, basically, right? You join the alliance, you sell off your economy, you suffer a slightly lower standard of living than your Western neighbors, but you're better off than you would be under Western sanctions and under Western condemnation. So for a time we were Asiatic or Eastern, now we're Western or Central, whatever you want to call it. And these uh, shifting identities are kind of very difficult to reckon with. And one, one problem I have uh, personally, there's so many people in Poland who kind of assume that their status as Westerners is a given despite all of the evidence that, that that status can be bestowed on you and can just as easily be taken away when you no longer suit the economic or political interests of the West. And so there's a very kind of fragile position that um, we as Eastern Europeans, as Slavs, exist in, um, which I think 
it sits at the heart of Russia's kind of long-standing attempts to seek accession to the West, mm. right? They were trying to enter NATO. They were trying to join the European Union. They were rebuffed and ultimately kind of found their political space elsewhere with other countries with an alliance that happens to include um, you know, the vast majority of countries in the global south or that has a potential to build alliances with them. Now, is this a bigger challenge for the West in the first Cold War? On the one hand, as you, uh, you, know, you cited, uh, speaking of Brzezinski again, who, who said that a union based on complementary grievances rather than ideology is far more dangerous. So the threat is profound because the, for the first time, as an economic powerhouse that has emerged in China that threatens the United States economic supremacy, and there is a sense that other states are rediscovering the confidence to build their own sovereign projects on principles, again, of a kind of reborn non-alignment. But on the other hand, we can't underestimate the unparalleled military power of the U.S. nor its belligerents. You know, the U.S. still has some 800 military bases around the world and is aggressively and openly plotting for war against China. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, you know, military general saying, recently that the U.S. might um, fight a war with China by 2025. You have active provocations and, and preparations. So I think that in a sense, we're seeing the beginnings of a very long final showdown. I say final showdown because we are literally facing the barrel of extinction, right? We have nuclear war on the horizon, but also climate change, which hasn't gone anywhere. anywhere. The military threat, of course, is escalating by the day, and we need to find solutions to these problems, to other problems, but the solutions are deadlocked by that belligerence, by that aggressive posture of the West in the face of its waning hegemony. But what happens next? I think everything depends on the people. Everything depends on how we organize, how we mobilize, and how we advance the project of socialism you know, in the face of possible extermination. And a big part of that is not turning to oppose those states that are trying to build a non-aligned position that are trying to establish zones of peace against the immense pressure that's being uh, wielded against them uh, by by the Western powers to pick a side. And speaking of some of those states, um, well, maybe not those states, but some some other states that are near them, you know, even though the US and the EU are bragging about how they've built this big coalition to help isolate Russia with condemnations and sanctions, in reality, as we've seen, the majority of the world is actually refusing to take a side, um, both rhetorically, but then also a majority of the world is refusing to join in on the sanctions, um, including, including surprisingly, U.S. proxies and allies like Saudi Arabia and India, a huge ally of the U.S., is refusing to get on board with these sanctions. What do you think is the significance of that? Because we're not talking here about like Venezuela or Syria or Cuba, which we would expect that from. Yeah, I think there's, so the, one of the really interesting things that happened recently is that the U.S. approached a bunch of Latin American countries and offered that they would replace their old Soviet weapons with new U.S. weapons if they agreed to send their old arsenals to Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Colombia's president, Gustavo Petro, he said that the country's policy is to build peace, not war. And that Colombia would not send weapons to prolong the war. In fact, I think it's written in the Colombian constitution that there's an obligation to try and build peace. Argentina said something similar and other countries said something similar. I think in that and in the examples you mentioned, India, Saudi Arabia, we see the project, the historical project of non-alignment breathing a second life. Right? It's very clear why states would oppose sanctions. Why states would impose sanctions in principle because all of these states know that they can very easily become the next target of sanctions. In fact, India was threatened by the U.S. with sanctions for continuing to trade uh, with Russia after February of last year. Um, now, the policy of non-alignment does not mean, as some in the West like to frame it, you know, neither Washington nor Beijing. It means we will not allow one power to force us to choose. We will work with whoever wants to work um, with us on terms that are you know, respectful of our sovereignty, on terms that are based on cooperation rather than domination. And one significant outcome here is that there is a real bloc that is emerging, which I think will be massively strengthened by Lula's victory in Brazil, 
that operates within what we could call a zone of peace. In fact, CELAC, which had its Congress recently, had declared Latin America to be a zone of peace. Now, that zone of peace does not take part in the West wars, does not take part in the West economic wars, it does not take part in the West military wars. And the main question, I think, and this goes back to the question of, you know, colonialism versus uh, liberation, is whether that zone of peace can expand and whether it can weather another wave of violence and retribution from the U.S. and its partners. Yeah, we'll have to see. It's a very important question. And I think, you know, to build on that, you describe multipolarity as an antidote to the enforced imbalance, imbalances in world capitalism that have characterized much of the past 500 years in which the unipolar moment had secured. So how do you think we could use multipolarity as a tool towards a better world? And how important is the rise of a country like China uh, to this end? Yeah, you know, Europe has basically since the global financial crisis, but more specifically since the sovereign debt crisis that destroyed Greece, has suffered from a complete and total crisis of underinvestment. So across the euro area, uh, or the countries that use the euro as a currency, public investment has basically hovered around zero since 2015. Actually, for, for technical reasons that I won't get into, it has actually been below zero. What does that mean? That's meant crumbling bridges, cracked roads, broken railroads, and so on and so forth. In that time, 18 countries in the European Union had signed, on, had signed up to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Now, the BRI is interesting. China, in the last few decades, did what probably no nation in history has achieved. Right? It went from being one of the poorest countries on earth to eliminating poverty and nearly su surpassing the U.S. on key economic indicators. And um, you know, it's said that China will surpass the U.S. by 2025, 2027, something like that. Um, now, what it has done once it's achieved that pretty advanced level of development at home is it started to export that development know-how and some of those principles abroad through the BRI building roads, building railways, building bridges to c connect the Eurasian landmass and beyond. And interestingly, in that time before, you know, especially under Trump, when I think many uh, European liberals uh, who are, you know, in, in the ruling class were kind of reluctant uh, to openly side with the US, there was a big spike in peaceful trade across the Eurasian landmass with Russia and with China for the first time in history. Now, the BRI was so attractive as an alternative to the austerian policies of the European Union, the kind of IMF and World Bank driven programs, that many European Union states signed up to it. Now, imagine what a program like that can mean to nations in Africa and Latin America, other nations in Asia that had been denied development altogether. And that had been the very first testing grounds for the vicious neoliberal policies that eventually found their way to Greece and Italy and so on. So I think the rise of China is the major story of our time and its ability to channel its lesson, the lessons of its process of development to other countries is a huge factor in that or in the emergence of that multipolar world. And we can see that the balance of trade is shifting away from the West or has already basically shifted towards China. Now, of course, on its own, the existence of alternative models of economic investment does not just you know, create progressive states out of thin air, but the opportunities to trade on terms of cooperation rather than domination, rather than submission, I think creates pathways for development that will in time create the conditions for greater prosperity, for greater dignity, for greater cooperation, for, and so on and so forth. And in the end, every state, no matter its government, has a basic imperative to feed its people, to provide a minimum standard of living for its people. And, you know, it's very hard to talk about social development. A lot of the things that we like to criticize poor states for in the West uh, when you have a hungry belly. And I think over time, these processes can find their expression in the emergence of more progressive political projects, more democratic political projects, unlike the structural adjustment legacy is left behind by the IMF and the World Bank across the you know, basically entirety of the world. Yeah. And I think that um, 
one of the most important parts of your piece is you, after kind of putting all this together, everything we've talked about, you break down these sort of lessons for the Western left. Um, and I think this is more important than ever right now for a lot of the reasons you mentioned, like the sort of final showdown, we're dealing with all these sort of apocalyptic possibilities, whether we're talking about climate change or the po potential of like nuclear war. And then also there's a sort of rising fascism, at least in some countries around the world, whether we're talking about like certain fascist parties taking power in places like Sweden or Italy. And then of course, like what you see in India. Um, so what's at stake for the left and just the world, I guess, what's at stake here uh, that makes this current fight so important? And what are the major lessons for the Western left? So everything is at stake. Absolutely, possibly for the first time in human history, everything is at stake. Talked about the climate crisis, right? The, the prognosis hasn't gone away because geopolitics have kind of started reconfiguring. The prognosis is still that by 2050, maybe, yeah, by 2050, we'll probably hit a point of no return, possibly sooner. Beyond which, uh, there was a wonderful model which showed that um, by 2100, under those conditions, the Sahara Desert will expand up to Poland rendering the entire uh, the entirety of Europe south of Poland uninhabitable, right? So that's coming. The COVID-19 pandemic was surely not the last to strike, right? There's many predictions that as climate change intensifies, that will intensify too. It's going to be unprecedented migration crises and so on and so forth. Now, going back to kind of the role of the left, in Europe, there have been some pretty impressive pretty big mobilizations in last year for peace and against the war. But the politics, unfortunately, is deadlocked and has been for a very long time. So on one hand, you have the European Union, which if you drill down to the core of what it is, it's basically a neoliberal trade agreement, right? Mm -hmm. Which is governed by a uh, series of technocrats, both in Brussels and in member state governments, that constrain democratic processes within member states. Member states can't choose how to spend money. They can't spend money to improve their societies. Sometimes they're forced to ravage their societies to pay back German and French banks, but they're constrained fundamentally in how they spend their public resources. So you have that technocratic center, the managers of the EU, whose job is to maintain that status quo. And they often implicitly or explicitly side with the right against the left. And we saw that in the collapse of the Corbyn project, the destruction of the Syriza project, and so on. Now, in many countries, the right has emerged as a force that purports to fill that gap. So you've had these mobilizations in Germany led by fascists who come out, who come out and say, you know, no war, no sanctions. We want to feed our families and heat our homes. And that resonates with people and you know, thousands of people come out into the streets. The left, by contrast, has been like, well, you know, it's complicated. We condemn this. We also condemn that. In fact, we disagree. The German left had open fights during the electoral season, like people within the party couldn't agree on basic questions. They say, you know, we, we, it's very complicated. We can't take a firm position on anything right now. And that's not a message from which you build a winning movement. The right, of course, can't be trusted on any of its opportunistic commitments. We know that Giorgia Maloney, the fascist leader now of Italy, was anti-EU and anti-NATO until she came to power. And now she's, you know, a massive champion of the alliance, and good <laughs> right. friends with the Brussels technocrats. Um, so you have this inability for a new world to emerge, this deadlock. Now, part of the ambivalence of the left is also, uh, you know, it's not only its refusal to kind of build from the needs of the people to say, okay, you need to heat your homes, you need to feed your families, I will walk in step with you, and I'll help you articulate that, and I'll help you build power around that. Instead, a lot of the energies are used to participate in various kind of parliamentary controversies, transient debates, and especially thinking about the rest, the rest of the world, this kind of unfortunate tendency, uh, especially in Europe, where, you know, a crisis emerges in Iran, and rather, ask, rather than asking, what did our governments do to contribute to that crisis in the first place? What did our governments do historically to contribute to the un underdevelopment of Iranian society? What can we do to build power in our own country to make sure that we can prevent that from happening again? They kind of seek out tokenistic groups within those countries that they can show solidarity or show support to in a way that 
um, isn't too controversial politically for them domestically. And so there's a kind of like, almost like a pseudo religiosity in this position where you still look at the world in terms of good and evil. Yeah. And there's still a kind of need to point fingers at people, but there's also a, a nihilism there, which says, well, our country's bad, their country's bad, uh, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. The future is, you know, we're basically screwed. And that tells us nothing about how we build a future for humanity. That tells us nothing about how we build socialism, because if everything is wrong, nothing is possible. And so, you know, across my, my very simple message to the left, because around the world, there are many political projects that are marching ahead in ways that are exciting, in ways that build peace, in ways that can teach, in ways that can, you know, sharpen our own political commitments. So my main lesson is listen, be prepared to draw in those lessons um, and be prepared to see and accept what's happening in places that are outside, you know, the immediate European and Western bubble. Because I think we stand a lot to learn from movements that are building beyond capitalism today. Well, Pavel, I want to thank you for spending so much time breaking all this down and for your really wonderful piece. And I want to remind people you can find it at Monthly Review. It's called NATO and the Long War on the Third World. And again, I will link to it in the description. But is there anywhere else you would like to draw people's attention so they can follow your work and, and the work that you and your colleagues are doing? Twitter. Everyone's <laughs> on Twitter. All roads lead to Twitter. Still. <laughs> for now. <laughs> for now. Wow. And we connected on Twitter. So, you know. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on. Great pleasure. Big fan of your show. And look forward to speaking again some, at some point. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.